Hey guys, welcome to Ready to Scale. I'm Ellie Perlman, your host, broadcasting from sunny California. When I'm not behind the mic, I buy multifamily properties with passive investors who partner with me on my deals. If you enjoy the podcast, please take a minute to rate us and don't forget to like and follow along with me on social media as well. So today I have for the second time, uh, the first time on Ready to Scale, but the second time on, you know, with me uh, on the show is Mark Kenny. So um, Mark and, and his wife, Tamil, they're seasoned real estate investors and the founders of Think Multifamily, a leading multifamily acquisition and education company. Um, Mark and his wife started their real estate career over 25 years ago, have invested in over 6,500 apartment units and also help others to invest in through to invest through syndication. Mark, it's really great to have you here on the show for the second time. Ellie, it's good to see you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so can you tell me and the listeners a little bit more about your background and, um, and how you got started in, in real estate? I know that you're, um, you're, you're, you're a numbers guy. You used to be a CPA in your past life. Right. That's so right. Tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. So I'm in Dallas now. I grew up in Michigan, one of seven kids, and uh, I have an identical twin brother. And we grew up with not really much. Okay. So we had food and place to live, which is more than a lot of people in the world, but we didn't have any extras and anything we wanted, you know, even a bike. We were buying our own bikes at 10 years old and things like that. I remember as a kid going, this kind of, kind of sucks <laughs> actually, you know, having to do that. I don't want my kids to have to do that. My my, my dad worked a lot of hours, so it wasn't a matter of him, you know, hoarding money. He just didn't have it with seven kids and, and things like that. So early on, both my brother and I were like, we're going to do something business-wise. We wanted to do things like, you know, a uh, sporting goods store and because we were athletic and things like that. And, uh, you know, kind of lost sight of a little bit and then went to college. Both of us went together and we were seniors in college. We said we wanted to start looking at real estate. and multifamily but really small like two two to four units and really the reason we didn't really have anyone in our family was doing it or any aunt uncle or anything like that but it was really one of those things that it made a lot of sense to us because as you mentioned we are we're both analytical both cpas and i can touch it i can feel it and this kids that could drive by it because it was right under you know two blocks from our house actually this was a block from our house the first one we bought and um we started buying small properties like that but I also was working a lot. I was doing, after doing IT, uh, after doing CPA for a couple of years, I did IT consulting, travel lots of times Friday night to Sunday night, come back on the weekends and try to evict people and shovel snow and things like that. And I was married at the time, got married young. And uh, we we're like, man, this is not really very good, but continued to buy small properties. I got caught up in corporate world. And then 2008, I started my own IT company and it was doing pretty well, you know, financially. Had a number of Fortune 100 companies as clients, but I was working, you know, I, I used to say 80, 85 hours, but probably working 90 plus hours consistently every week. I would sleep about three hours a night. And then um, my wife, uh, Tamil, we were on a walk and she's like, this isn't working, you know, and um, she was thinking about leaving because I was never there. I actually did spend time with the kids, believe it or not. As much as I worked, I was I found time to spend with them. I'm like, they're gonna grow up so fast, they're gonna be out of the house, I'm gonna spend time with them and ignore my wife, Jamil. So it kind of rude awakening to me to me. And I said, Well, you know, if we're gonna do it, let's do larger multifamily. We we love real estate anyways, we both did since we were young. And uh, it was a while. I mean, it took us like a year to get our first deal. We started looking at a bunch of deals and it was frustrating. We looked at other things too other asset classes or franchises, you name it, basically something to get me out of my, my current situation, not financially because I was doing well, but more from a, from our standpoint. So uh, my wife, Tamil got very engaged as well. And then we just started looking at properties. We got a property after a year, long time, but we got one. And uh, I started scaling back slowly on the IT side. And in about less than three years, I was at zero. Uh, from an IT consulting perspective, and we were doing multifamily full time, and then uh, later on after that, looked at doing you know education piece. But uh, that was kind of the way we got started, really in multifamily. So it was I kind of I didn't say I didn't have a choice, but I kind of didn't have a choice. If I wanted to, you know, have a, a good marriage, I wanted I needed to do something. That's a very inspiring 
story. I think it's, uh, and it's very impressive. You know, you've, you've done well for yourself. And then basically someone is saying, listen, this is not enough. It's, it's not only about, you know, providing for your family, but it's providing the attention and, and, you know, the, the quality time for everyone. I think it's a very, very important distinction. Um, it's a so distinction because I can tell yeah. you I had thoughts going through my head. I really did. And she knows them too. Like, like, what do you mean? I make good money. I take the kids to school. You pick them up if I can. I'm doing all these things, but basically wasn't doing anything with her. And um, so your your sort of spot on was the money didn't. I mean, yes, you need money to live and, and things like that. Um, not saying you should be poor, but the the fact is that we had you know we had more than we needed doing IT consulting. Yeah, and I think it's great that you guys are doing it together. I see you often in many you know many conferences and. Yeah. Uh, um, online and offline uh, events. You're always together. Um, you're always, you know, I kind of see you either next to one another or, or on both sides of the room speaking, you know, engaging with people. And I, I think that's, that's yeah. interesting. Um, it's, uh, you know, it also attracts certain type of investors or people. It's, it, you, and, and that's the name actually of your company, Think Multifamily. Right. Um, it's, it's all about, you know, you're, you're kind of showing um, that you can do it as a family. There's a lot of family values in the brand that you're, you know, representing. And I, I think it's, it's really interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, let's dive a little bit into asset and talk a little bit about asset protection. So you and your wife, you're mainly investing in multifamily. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about some of the um, steps that you've taken to protect your assets um, during the pandemic, maybe, you know, unique ways that usually uh, we don't see from, from other investors? Yeah, so we use third-party management companies, uh, and we have properties in six states, and we have uh, essentially um, four different management companies across those, those six states. So we do rely on them heavily, and we've been able to compare kind of who's, who's doing what. So some management companies were very proactive, uh, and you could argue good or bad, frankly, like almost scaring, potentially try to scare tenants into like, whatever you need, we'll do whatever. And if you don't pay your rent, you know, we'll uh, work with you. And I understand those things, but it's a, it's a big balance. We've never been in this situation before. No one in, that I know of has ever been in this situation before where we're literally not allowed to evict between 60 and 120 days, maybe more in some places. So our whole thing was, we kind of want to, you know, we have some cash reserves, obviously, in, in different properties, and some are more than others, you know, and some are like, hey, we could go a real long time uh, and be totally fine. Others are like, hey, I hope, you know, hope we can collect the rents there, you know. Um, so we, one, we asked our PMs to give us daily collections, and we asked them to compare it to last month. So for like, you know, April 7th, what was it on March 7th? So we've been getting daily collections to monitor we did things, and this isn't anything unique, frankly, is, you know, like prepay, prepay for the month of April and get a discount, gift cards and things like that. Um, and then just trying to offer programs to potential tenants. And, you know, some tenants, unfortunately, probably going to take advantage of the system. Uh, I think it comes down to if you weren't treating your tenants with respect and fairly all along, uh, they're going to probably try to take advantage of you. The biggest thing for us really has been is really closely monitoring those collections and then figuring out which expenses we can reduce. Some, you know, maybe landscaping you can hear there. It's getting harder now because, you know, it's getting prime time for that. Um, and there are other things like kind of rehab. So some of the CapEx stuff we were doing, we scaled back. Um, some of it to do less on the interior and just kind of turn, turn the units people that are renewing or, or they're looking to vacate, offering them, you know, uh, rent with no char no upcharge from where it was and things like that. So I think it's a lot of little things, uh, frankly. And then you have the other complete side of it is, you know, whether your lenders, what do you do? And I know a lot of people are completely jumping right ahead to forbearance, which means you work with a lender and and uh, you know you don't pay initially, but you're going to pay eventually. And there are a lot of limitations, frankly, with that program. So, mm -hmm. to me, uh, you know, they said, "Hey, oh, by April 1st," and like, how would anyone know by April 1st how April is going to look? 
you know what I mean? We were so far into March that that didn't really impact anybody. So looking at April, so people were just jumping on that. And, and I'm not saying you shouldn't call your lender, but we were like, let's kind of see how we're looking on certain properties. We have about 40 properties. Um, so um, some people, like I said, are being probably proactive on that. But to me, how you don't have you don't have any data points right now. What do you give your lender to say, well, yeah, I'm going in for a bear. And so it's like, well, compare, give me proof that these people didn't pay and why they didn't pay and they lost their job. Well, we're at April, we were at April 1st or end of March. We had no data points then. Um, so, uh, but it's, if it's required to do that, to, you know, save a property, then I think in this, this day and age, some cases you're looking to do what you can to survive on some properties. Um, some will do better than others, but you know, people probably need to get out of their head. They're going to get that. They're probably not going to get, you know, big distributions during this time right now. Frankly, I think it's, I'd rather save the cash. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that during the forbearance, you um, cannot distribute to investors at all. And it's not only during the 90 days where you're oh, hitting shit. the pause button. It's also for the entire 12 to 18 months while you're making those distribution, the, those uh, forbearance payments, none of your investors can get paid. And, and so, and not to, you know, I know it's not going to maybe impact your credit or at least that's what right. they say technically, but the next time you're going to get a deal, guess what? Right. Lenders are going to know that you have an, I'm sure it's going to be a question. Have you right. applied for, for, for forbearance and yeah. that would, you would pay for it in future deals. You're going to get higher interest rate because they're just right. evaluated your risk as someone who's more likely to default on their payments. So it, and you can't actually you can evict. Do, yeah, you can't it. evict during exactly. that time either for you're talking exactly. 12 to 18 months. So I'm That's not saying exactly. that it's not an option because I think you have to look at all your options, but mm -hmm. I know people literally that were just they were calling calling the lender in March. No joke, end of March. I'm like, what like what do you like, what do you tell them? You have n you have no information to tell them. You don't them. have any data, yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. So we're recording this it's April 7th. Um, it takes probably until the 10th because some people are still going to be a little bit late, but they will bring the check um, to you. It's going to take at least a week, minimum a week, you know, um, until you know exactly how much you can, how much you, you've collected. So I think you're absolutely right. And I would not recommend anyone to communicate with their lenders without going through a lawyer first and don't have anything in writing. I can say right. that as a former lawyer because they will That's right. be used against you. So be very careful. Right. All right, um, let's, uh, let's talk about the million dollar question. Uh, and I wanna move kind of from the asset protection to uh, part two strategy. I, you know, I've been hearing a lot of back and forth, you know, conversations between sponsors. Some are saying this is the best time to, to buy. We've been waiting for this since 2010 or nine. Um, the market was hot. We were overpaying or others were overpaying for deals. We've been waiting for an opportunity. This is the time to buy. And then you hear others saying, but there's so much uncertainty. Now is not the time to make any move. What are your thoughts? Should we buy mm -hmm. now or should we wait until this crisis is over? So I personally think you should always be looking. I don't care what's going on in the marketplace. Um, there are definitely some unknowns. I'd be a lot more concerned if this was a, you know, a housing crash, like it was in 08 and 09, it's not. Uh, it doesn't mean that there can't be big, huge impacts to negative on this or, or, you know, they're dumping, at least in the short term, you know, $2 trillion in the economy. And you can argue that that's, you know, long term, not a good, good uh, thing to do. But in the short term, it's going to stimulate something just it's going to have to. I think it depends how long. The shutdown really happens if it comes people are back on and you know um end of march early april i think personally the impact would be less but think of it any single person right now in the world that's trying to sell a property they have to sell the property there's literally no other reason why anybody that with the right mind would list a property right now to sell it but you have situations in every case you have whether it's divorce or medical or you know partnership there's always situations so we're already like last week we got multiple deals sent to us that were deals we bid on, you know, would have been probably 60 days ago and uh, we didn't get, we weren't awarded the, the contract, but the buyer that was awarded the contract, the buyers have backed out of the deal that provides opportunity in my mind. You know, any, any seller that's selling, you can go back to them and say, well, this property is, you know, overnight, you know, unfortunately went down in value for them. 
and lending terms have changed and you know putting in the interest reserves and things like that so it's a totally different deal today personally we're looking we're actively looking there are a lot less deals frankly in the market right now but we have deals right now I mean there are a couple that were just listed and it's like you you know already off the bat that the, the seller is is in dire need to sell and they're also if they're in dire need they're gonna go with somebody that can close deals they're not gonna take a chance on somebody that's new or you know fairly inexperienced so that does give us a little leg up because we've closed a lot of deals and some of the brokers you know someone in Atlanta we've closed like 13 deals with one broker right so when deals come back to the market because someone else can't get them plus we get good lending you know terms are good changing you know by the day um, you know they changed a lot again last week and I, I don't see them probably frankly changing that much more as far as what they're requiring um, but they, they changed quite drastically uh, on the lending side and that gives us uh, another opportunity. So, you know, people are like, oh, you know, cap rates are going up. Well, what data points do you have? Now, logically, I would agree if I'm paying less for a property, but, you know, properties really aren't selling right now. So you don't have the data to say, well, guys said, oh, you know, cap rates should go up two points. Based on what? I mean, you know, these people that are projecting this, they had he sent me some article. I'm like, well, if they're not trying to be mean, if they're so smart, then, why they why didn't they predict, predict this you know six weeks ago the fact is it's just a guess right now so um, I do think regardless and, and people can argue with me but there's really no argument that eventually over time if you take care of the asset it will go back up how long will it take I don't know but when people are talking about cap rates and they're like what are you gonna do if the cap rates go up it's like then we're if it we're cash flowing we're gonna hold the property longer right I mean the last recession, I think, was you know 22 months. Um, you know that's that's long, but that was a that was a financial issue. So if this comes back quicker, I think we won't. We'll see lenders being a little more generous, you know, um, and we'll see cap rates. Maybe they might go up right now because everyone has the selling has to do it, but the inventory is so small that those will, might have a very negligible impact in the overall grand scheme of things because we probably have. You know, two percent of the inventory <laughs> that we typically would have at this time of the, the you know this year so if we sell some handful of properties here and there cap rates are higher and we you know three months from now start selling properties again I you know I don't know how big of an impact it's gonna have but um, but yeah we're actively looking and uh, you know people that sit on the sidelines frankly who've been sitting on the sidelines or people that are doing things that you know uh, oh well you know I haven't bought for the last six years because it's too hot well Frankly, you've lost out on a lot of money. That's you true. know, and yeah. uh, I think the key is having the cash reserves, which you know is easier on some properties than other to just be able to survive. If you can survive during these down times and you're a patient and hold the property long enough, it will go back up. I don't know how long, but it, it will go back up. Yeah, that's a very good point. Do you think that you know you're basically saying a strategy that your your strategy is basically to keep you know, looking and carefully buying, do you believe that there's enough demand from, from what you see from investors to invest in those deals? That's the bigger question, actually, in my mind. Uh, it's mixed. There's no question that some investors have gone, you know, totally silent saying, hey, I'm, I'm not doing yeah. anything right now. This is too, um, I think somebody that knows, hey, you got a deal, it was, make these numbers up, it was, you know, $90,000 a door, Five weeks ago now we're getting in for 80 or 75 wherever it is a door and by the way we have 12 months of interest payments plus we have working capital and another contingency of 10 percent we have payments for three years of mortgage payments um, that should give investors you know some some comfort and then you have people in the stock market that okay the last two days I agree they've done well but I mean mm -hmm. it's it's uh, you know crazy crazy some people are gonna take those gangs from the market and look to put it somewhere but I think there's no question that they're gonna be less investors investing right now um, in a very short top term and then I think it's gonna actually offer more opportunities because people are gonna be like this stock market thing is just you know a roller coaster like crazy um, so we'll, we'll see we'll see on the, the capital out there yeah yeah I think you made a very good point um, if you have enough reserves then you can 
you know, you, you can do pretty well, or maybe, maybe not pretty well with all your, your pro on all your properties, but you can survive this. Um, right. so I, I, you know, what we did is we went back to all of our investments and we looked at how much money we had on, you know, CapEx budget, just in case we need that money to pay the debt, for instance, or any other right. essential, you know, um, expense. We looked at the break even analysis that changed since we we've purchased the property yeah. and said, okay, what is the percentage? If half the building is not paying us, half the building stop paying us, are we able to pay the rent, the, the, uh, the mortgage? Are we able to pay utilities and understand right. what's, you know, our exposure and investors are asking for those figures. And when you're yeah. communicating with investors and you say, Hey, we ran the numbers. If I don't know, I'm just making it up 40% of the, of the, um, of the units of the, of the, the tenants are stopped paying only then we're breaking even then even in the crazy world of today, thinking about, you know, 200 unit apartment building where almost half or stop mm -hmm. paying, that's still pretty extreme. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. So that kind of help, it, it helps putting things in perspective and say, okay, you know, we, we understand now how to kind of quantify the risk because that's the, the focus. If you can't really quantify the risk, then, then it's, you know, what do you communicate to investor? What price do you put on the next deal? Um, you know, right. the next LOI that you, you send out. Um, yeah, I, I think all of those are, are you know, very important, um, you know, points. And hopefully short term, right? Hopefully you're not like, yeah. you know, we've always looked at break even occupancy, break even rents, things like that. But hopefully it's like, okay, yeah, you have a few months of a dip, whatever, pick it. Even if it's a year, if you survive, it's going to go back up. Then you're, you know, a lot of other investments are just going, they're done, right? I mean, you're talking, mm -hmm. you know, they're not surviving. Very, very many, a lot of businesses will not survive. And if you can survive, like to your point, you know, with let's say 40% economic vacancy, that's, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it also, it shows you if you bought the property at the right price, because if you bought it, if you overpaid, then your right. the, your mortgage payments are going to be much higher than what you can handle right now, which is, you know, part, part of the, the equation. That's Interesting. Right. Um, so I want to kind of move in, into the next kind of topic and talk about the process. Um, so assuming that, you know, you found a deal and you want to take advantage of the fact that right now you're saving, you know, five, ten, twenty thousand mm dollars -hmm. per door, which is a dream that we've all wanted to be in that right. place, um, you know, years ago and, and even two months ago, um, how would you, what would you say is going to change in the acquisition process? Um, is it yeah. similar to how it was two, three months ago? What things, you know, what kind of challenges do you see in that arena? Yeah, I think the, the one you have is the legal aspect that things are going to take longer. I mean, this is no joke. I had some issues with uh, my bank account yesterday. I was on the phone for two hours and 22 minutes with the bank and then finally they said then it was automated right and they said we're sorry we're closed call back tomorrow and so whether it's title banks everything is take longer so in sellers know that then you have the other aspect of what happens if you're under contract and the lender really does come back and says we're not gonna give you the money they can do that right and you app, app fee well well you know give you back we'll give you back your money for app fee but we're not gonna give you the money for the loan so before we were never having any, we never had financing contingencies, you know, for the last whatever, you know, years and years, right? Well, now you're going to get it. And um, putting things in there around numbers and, you know, the occupancy number, which is a little less important, frankly, it's really more the collections now. It's kind of a little more different focus, NOI and things like that. Um, and then you have the, that's like the legal. And then you have the physical piece. Okay, what happens? You go under contract and you have to go visit the property. Our, uh, due diligence company we use, we use on our properties, very, very tech savvy for one. So he has it where he has 3D modeling, virtual reality, I mean, a bunch of stuff, this guy, you know, company. So company you, is this? It's, it's Heritage. Heritage. Heritage, we use them for all the due diligence and they've been great. And so they could go there and they, they, they continue to go there. They're doing a bunch of construction stuff right now, rehab. The, the issue you run into, what happens if the tenant doesn't want you to come in? Well, 
they're actually all masked up and they have gloves and they like they look like they're very safe, right? For somebody getting the comfort level, and not everyone's gonna let them in. But it's been higher. We did we did one not that long ago, and the percentage was was very high. The number of people that they got into, and there were some that just said, "Hey, I'm not gonna do it." Um, you know, then you say, "Okay, well, what do you do?" Let's say it's 100 units, and you get into 80 of them. Well, 20 percent in my mind is is still a pretty big problem. I know lenders aren't even requiring you to get in all of them, um, which I don't know what the right number is, but I mean, I would be, I would have to be in 90 some percent of them before I would move forward on a property. People have done that all the time. Like, hey, how many people ask, how many units should we go look at? 20, 25%, I'm like all of them. You know, mm -hmm. before we had issues where we couldn't get in because someone changed locks and we would, we had one property, two or eight doors and we, we drilled 36 locks. No joke wow. to get in. So now you're running issues. So but. sorry. So your guys, they're basically uh, heritage guys. They're all suited up and, and and they put on masks. They look like CDC, you know, kind right. of employees. They're walking in and they're so they're protecting themselves and the tenants from. That's right. Interesting. Okay, from any yeah. disease. And then if you don't want to go for whatever reason, they'll they'll stream it live back to you. Mm. And they're very very. They take thirty five to forty pictures of every interior of every single unit. So very very detailed. And what do you do um, with the other twenty percent? Well, that's to me. If we couldn't get in twenty percent of them, I I wouldn't, and we really couldn't. And we're going to close the deal. I wouldn't move forward. Probably, I really wouldn't. I think we. I wouldn't have to probably feel comfortable getting ninety some percent, ninety some mm -hmm. around there, because even if you say have something legally, I mean, you're you know, an attorney, right? And say, okay, well, hey, Mister Seller, um, when we can actually get in these, like you know, a month after closing, two months after closing. We're going to ask for a credit. Well, if you couldn't get into some of them, then I would want some money escrowed by the seller. When we close the deal, we're putting whatever the number is, 500 grand in escrow. And you, Mr. Seller, don't get it. We'll, we'll decrease it down as we get into the units to, to look at them. Um, but trying to go back to us, anybody after the fact and collect, good luck. You're going to spend money yeah, doing it. So hard. the money needs to be in escrow. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting approach and very, very good idea because it is problematic. Even if there's, you know, money sitting in escrow, it's a little bit challenging. Okay, you're 60 days post-closing. Now you have mold in, in unit right. 2207. Right. Uh, now, now you can't prove that the mold right. was there unless, you know, um, unless you have an open ticket that the, you know, right. you need to prove that there was no open ticket when you bought it. So maybe you can get a list of all the open tickets yeah. that the PM has so you can verify, but it's still not a hundred percent proof because maybe they didn't record it. Maybe they went ahead, yeah. they went and erased some, you know, uh, you know, tickets. It, it gets tricky. It gets tricky for sure. Right. And maybe one of the items, you know, totally throwing them out there. Maybe we're going to have seen little robots or little, you know, little, little robots going around doing due diligence for us. I don't know. That um, should be the case regardless because they're much less, uh, you know, I, I, I think the, uh, the likelihood of a robot making a mistake is yeah. probably lower than in a human that walks 200, 100, oh, yeah. you know, 300 units. As long day. as they know their floor plan, they would know exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. yes. Have all the pictures yeah. for us and things like that. So, but I, th I think there, there are some ways to kind of help, you know, ease some of that pain or if you're like, hey, I can't get in a bunch of them. But if you're getting like 50% of them, I mean, it's not even a, a, a question in my mind. I'm not moving forward with the deal. Uh, there's no way. There's, there are too many unknowns and yeah. Yeah. And, and what do you do with, um, with collections and the P and L? So basically let's say, you know, April, you know, we're, we will have April's financials, but then you sign a contract and you move forward. It takes about, you know, 60, maybe 90 days to close right. if you have an extension or two. And then what do you do? You're looking at when you get the May and maybe even June financials and they're much worse than April, but you're already under contract. What do you yeah. do then? Yeah, we've had, even before COVID-19, we've had, verb we'd always get away with it. We have verbiage in our contract that will allow us, based on the NOI, us getting rebates, credits towards the purchase price. Um, but you, you have to be careful whether you do a credit towards purchase price or credit because that could reduce your loan proceeds. So, you know, maybe it's a credit for repairs, so, something along those lines. But we've had NOI targets, and if they don't meet them, then they have to give us, you know, we pay less for the property, essentially. 
Yeah, and I think you, um, you. I think this is an amazing tip, by the way. That's what we've done on one of our properties. But you're right. I mean, when you have a new NOI that is lower, the lender pays attention, and you can get a cut in, you know, proceeds. But you want to know what is the the most up to date rent roll and P and L right. right before you close. And if, if there's a significant change, you have to tell the lender, you can't get away with it because you don't want to mess with bad, bad boy, you know, carve That's outs, right. holding on material information. Um, but you, you do want to know, but I like the idea of putting the credit towards, um, uh, uh, what was it that you said? I think like repairs was, or something. Repairs, you know, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And not basically reduce the price. So, because also if you reduce the price, that's considered retrade and you right. can really, you know, um, that can maybe not really, but that can impact your, um, kind of credibility when you're working with, um, with, uh, with brokers, because you don't want right. to be perceived as someone who's, uh, you know, who's retrading. And it's one of the questions they ask you actually on the right. questionnaire that you're getting as a buyer. Right. Um, have you ever, you know, have you ever done any retrade and why and what happened there? Because that's a, a red flag that you're just gonna, you know, cause some buyers, their tactic is just to put a high number, get, get the deal. And then they find all the things that, you know, um, that they can possibly find and they'll come back and say, Hey, um, we didn't know about this, 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 and this, here's a million dollar less. Let's move forward. So, right. You know, the, you know, some people would argue with the, you know, not reducing the price. If you have a higher price, your, your taxes, cause some, some cities, you know, states require disclosure. So your taxes could be higher by having a higher price. Right. But mm -hmm. I still think from a loan proceed perspective, you're probably better off getting the credit. Um, but yeah, that, those are things you could do to try to help during that time. And, you know, who knows, six months from now, we might be back to where we were, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it's going to be shorter than that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Mark, any final thoughts or, you know, advice before we move to the lightning round questions? No, I would say, um, you know, it's on, it's a little bit little unknowns out there, right? So put things in place, like with your process, stuff, put things in place that are going to give you more data. I keep talking about data a little bit because people are acting like they have data and it doesn't exist. It's just now existing, right? So Work off the facts. Don't work off someone saying, oh, cap rates are going up, you know, to 8%. I mean, there's, there's nothing to, to say that. I mean, um, so people get scared because of that um, more so than, than anything. And I'm not saying that these people can't be right. I'm not saying that. But if you can cash flow a property and continue to cash flow it, the cap rate means nothing to you at all unless you're going to do a refi or supplement a loan or a sale. Mm -hmm. So, yes, on paper, your properties are going to be worth less. But if you're still cash flowing just like you were before and your debt payment's the same, then just stick with it. Be patient. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I love the, um, you know, you were saying worth less, um, which I think that's the right approach to see it, it in the short term. Yeah. Um, but it's, there's a huge difference between a property that is worth less than a property that is, a, is a, that is basically worthless, which is pretty extreme. Because oh, even yeah. a property with a hundred percent, you know, um, with a zero percent economic occupancy, yeah. nobody is paying. It's still not worthless. It's worth less, but not worthless. That's right. And you know, you know, people yeah. even with stocks, people are like, oh, I lost money in the stock market today. And like, well, did you sell? No, I didn't sell, but I lost money. It's like you didn't sell, you didn't lose money, you didn't make money. Just like real estate. You know, you're not making mm -hmm. money or, you know, if you're less, you know, if you have to sell property to make money. So cash flow is going to be king, really. Oh, yes. Cash flow is king. I love cash flow. All right. So let's move forward to the last part of our uh, conversation, the lightning round questions. The question number one, Mark, what's your favorite hobby? Working out. Working out. The, nice. Uh, yeah. yeah. What do you do exactly? Uh, pretty much just weights and, and then some cardio hit and things like that. Uh, unfortunately all the gyms are closed. I'm doing it at home, mm -hmm. which I don't like at all, but I'm still doing it. So. We'll... All right. Um, what's the one thing that people don't know about you? Uh, both my wife and I are twins. So most people don't really? know. Really? Mm -hmm. oh, I didn't know that. That's, that's really great. Do you have twins? Any of your kids are twins or no, no, no. Cause usually genetic. Yeah. I'm identical. And, uh, so it's kind of a, Fluke and then my wife, she has a sister. My wife has a sister twin, but they're, uh, they're fraternal. So most people know I'm a twin just because it's different things, but most people don't know that she's a twin. 
Wow, interesting. Um, what do you wish you had known when you just started buying real estate? Overraise. Okay. Always have more money. How much do you usually overraise? 10, 20%? We usually have um, about 18%, just the way it works out, about 18% normal without the max raise. That's kind of more like the, the minimum and then try to raise above that. So. Uh, I would say at least that. It really depends how much you're using for CapEx, frankly, but mm -hmm. um, we do we do 18% minimum. Nice. That's very helpful. Um, I, I love well, we do price. now, frankly. Yeah. So to be, to be frank, we haven't always done that. Yeah, so, it, it, same here. It, it takes time to figure out that this is what yeah. you should do. It's just I wish we would have, but yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the number one advice to real estate investors who want to scale their business or portfolios, especially now during you know, a pandemic? What are uh, get ed get real education and uh, kind of block out the noise, frankly. And, and I mentioned earlier, I think you should always be looking. Whether you think it's a good time or not, you should still be looking. You're going to learn something new every time you look at something. You just are. And uh, you're going to build those relationships. So even if you're not a buyer right now, building those broker relationships. So I would say just always be active no matter what. Don't. I'm not saying you shouldn't be cautious about things, but I'd say people overreact frankly, in my opinion, lots of times. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. Um, last question is, that's the quickest question. Where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you and learn how to work with you or for any other reason? Yeah, my email is mark, M-A-R-K, at thinkmultifamily.com. That's the, the best way to get a hold of me. All right, perfect. Well, Mark, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to see you again and to host you for the second time on the podcast. I really, really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Ellie. I appreciate it.